And I think part of this problem is that in the past, you've had Ferrari ownership and management that have taken some of the political pressure and whatever else off the team boss. And, you know, you knew who they were. They were big, towering figures. You could watch the track action or you could wander around a lot. But it's like if there was the best way to grow in that sort of thing is where there's a group of you where you can pitch your spot and someone's always there. One thing I've tended to find about people who like Formula One cars is, you know, the classic one, the ones they always go back to are the ones that they fell in love with when they first started watching this. Can you imagine coming out of the world of Formula One where you're in your little bubble into World Endurance Championship where anyone and their dog can, like, try and grab your attention and your time? It must be very difficult. So David, you know, like um, we've been obviously discussing the the championship battle so far, and just the kind of fierceness of it as well. You know, some of the highs and lows for Ferrari too. We know that you know they've got a car that's definitely worthy of fighting for a championship, but you know at times, either through reliability, through strategy call, or even through driver error, sometimes it's not always gone to plan. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Just generally speaking, and on top of that as well. What happens if Ferrari don't win the championship? Because, you know, we, we already know that Mercedes are trying to catch ground in, in, in just the development race. W13 seems more and more competitive week in, week out. We also know that McLaren and Aston Martin have a lot of investment going on. McLaren have a new wind tunnel and a new simulator they're looking to bring forth. And also Aston Martin and, uh, well, as we always call him, uh, Daddy Stroll, <laughs> Lauren Stroll himself, has been investing a lot of money in getting the new Aston Martin factory up and running to speed as well, despite some of the um, COVID um, re well, restrictions that happened too. So where does that put Ferrari? And is there, this the best opportunity for them to get uh, you know, within the championship fight? Or is there still light at the end of the tunnel for them? Well, there's always light at the end of the tunnel. But as they say, the problem is the light is sometimes a train. Hmm. Yeah, um, as it gets closer to the whole point of these regulations and stuff, the new regs, the budget caps, the sliding scale, the uh, things that you can use for wind tunnels and stuff, is to eventually bring the field much closer together. Um, you know, even the lower down teams are nearly at the level where they can afford the budget cap. So you know, they don't have as much money to spend on everything else. But then by the time you get to a team like Aston Martin, you know, we're making jokes about them this year, but they've got one of the best budgets arguably on the grid. You know, Lawrence Stroll is a very ambitious man, perhaps too much um, is the only negative there because, you know, you can push people more than they necessarily want to be pushed in certain ways. But, you know, he's got, he wants to win. He is driven to win. Um, they've got the new factory coming online, which, you know, with COVID and whatever else, it's set them back a little bit of time. You know, they've got a massive increase in their workforce they've just had, which obviously, again, has taken time to settle in. But by the time that all evens out, given it another couple of years, they're going to be a force. You know, they're going to be really worth considering very competitive, I'd imagine. Well, it's similar with McLaren, as you said, they've got other stuff coming in as well. You know, Zach is a very slick operator, even if he does seem to think that he needs 10 cars for his team. Um, so yeah. it's going to get, it's going to get tight. Absolutely, you know, and then another thing we um, were discussing as well there, David, is this, the, the kind of like nature and just the kind of um, the, the kind of atmosphere at Ferrari right now too, you know, because obviously yeah. we've had the very kind of shrewd Riva Bene, we've had uh, Stefano Di Minicali, we had Russ Braun, we had just John Todd as well. They were very like, you know, shrewd and very kind of, you almost had to like have everything correct before you even come before them. Whereas I believe Bonotto, in a positive light, he's kind of taken the pressure off the team in certain regards. He's tried to adopt some of Toto Wolf's um, philosophy and like a no-blame culture. And, you know, everybody actually seems to be a bit more kind of relaxed and more like harmonious in the team. 
but having said that too you know like uh, as we were discussing before as well like sometimes you just need to keep people on their toes and, and that kind of iron fist and that kind of um you know like how how would we even describe it i think we mentioned earlier almost like uh an assertiveness and almost like uh, uh like a, a almost like never die approach to to wanting to achieve the, the heights of being you know the formula one champions and trying to secure the constructors and trying to be dominant and putting your foothold you know on the stakes of what is the world championship you know yeah. i'd invite you to have your comments on that too yeah no um the thing is, they've worked very, very hard because, you know, under a River Bene, at the start of the year or whatever else, you'd see a lot of success from the team. You'd see a happy Arriva Bene, you know, talking to the press, you know, having a laugh, whatever else. And as the year sort of went on and more stuff kept happening, whether it was development going down the wrong alleyway or Seb overdriving, trying to make up for the fact that stuff on the car wasn't necessarily working and stuff as he wanted. Um it became less and less visibly comfortable in the team. And, you know, Riva Bene would sort of cancel press stuff. And it just, obviously, the more bad stuff happens in a team, the more needle there is or whatever else, that can be very, not evasive, what's the word I'm looking for? Either way, sort of like a poison almost, you know? Um, mm. So they sort of, after that they wanted desperately to get away from that and you know it feels very much like it does you know ferrari talk these days about being a happy team they're having issues obviously but they seem to be getting you know as a team they seem to be quite happy you know i've been on you know video calls with like various team members and stuff and obviously they're always going to put a positive light on it and stuff but there's definitely more openness there than I'd say there is in the past. Uh, maybe that's just adapting to like modern expectation of what we expect from teams and stuff. Cause obviously they're not the only team who does that sort of thing. But um, as I said, when Arriva Benny was there, it was a lot of needle and a lot of almost sulking um, and a lot of suspicion and negativity. Um, the problem of Bonotto to a certain extent is he's an engineer, you know, he's worked his way up to being manager of engineering, but I'm never convinced he's able to sort of deal with, there's so much more to being a team boss than that, whether it's like the deals and stuff like Zach Brown does or the people management and the various other things that goes on. You always get the feeling of Bonotto where he wants to be is back in the factory tinkering with stuff. Mm. And I genuinely think he's a good person and I genuinely quite like him. And I think part of his problem is that in the past, you've had Ferrari ownership and management that have taken some of the political pressure and whatever else off the team boss. And, you know, you knew who they were. They were big, towering figures. And these days, it's a bit like, well, who runs Ferrari? And, and I think the team has suffered a bit from that because in the past it was like, you know, people joked almost about them owning the FIA and all the decisions that stuff that went that way. And now it's almost sort of, you know, we talk about the way Christian or Toto go to work. And there's no one at Ferrari who seems to have that vice like grip on it, you know? It's sort of like you always sort of feel like if they go into bat against Mercedes or Red Bull on a political thing, they're gonna not they're not gonna win it, and that never used to be the way it was in the past. Um, so I think to a certain extent the team's suffering with that. There's also the issue whereby you can be try and be too good to the team to a certain extent. There's there needs to be a balance between, you know, getting away from a blame culture and actually taking actual look at what's going on and working out, you know, not who to blame or exactly, but if someone's struggling in a position, you know, what could you do to support them? You know, what do you need to improve something if it's not going right? 
And from the outside looking in, at least, obviously, we don't know what goes on in the factory. We don't know the conversations they're having. Of course, Bonotto to the press is going to support his people. You know, that's his job. But we don't know the conversations they're having in the factory. And because we don't, when we see it happening, and kind of happening again, it feels like they're not learning. Um, as I hate to bring it up to a certain extent, because obviously, you know, it's a bad memory for a lot of people, but <clears throat> I genuinely suspect that if Max had been driving for Ferrari last year, Lewis would have won an Abu Dhabi because Red Bull operationally uh, bloody brilliant. You know, they are a, they they set a bar. Every everything they can push to manipulate change a result make the team they're racing against react they do that they go to war every race you know it's like the strategy okay they're doing that we're going to do this to put, apply pressure to them whereas ferrari it's like almost strategy by committee you know i started off this video talking so positively about my team and we've done a great car we've got lots of great people at our factory and there's lots of reasons why it's good. But there's certain things that just don't come together. Um, as I said, if you look at Red Bull at Abu Dhabi, you know, they didn't arguably have the car there. The combination wasn't as strong as the Mercedes and Lewis. That happens. Um, but Max drove it as well as he could do. The team made all the strategy moves every time an opportunity came up to try and apply pressure, you know, jumping onto new tyres or whatever. Every time there was a sniff of an opportunity to try and get an edge, you know, deploying Sergio excellently, him defending like his life depended on it. Contractually, maybe it did. Um, and all this stuff left them an opportunity that... Yeah, it shouldn't have happened, but it did. But they'd done the stuff to take advantage of it. And if that had been Ferrari, I don't think they'd have done that to do that. And that's a large part of the difference between Ferrari and Red Bull, is that Ferrari have said for years, actually, which is really annoying, that in terms of a team, they're quite a young team, as in like the people being in the positions they're in. Mm. You know, as in that they've risen up through various other things or whatever to become that, but they haven't got necessarily as much experience in key positions as some other teams do. My issue with that is they've been saying the same thing since 2017. But, you know, <laughs> so it, but they're just, they don't have the ruthless, persistent, clinical edge that you need to take a championship and you know we could have survived the reliability issues um even the driver issues to a certain extent and we'd have still been in the fight if it hadn't been for the strategy blunders as well but by the time you combine all three of them and max gaining points every time because of them that's just wiped it out so work to do. Yep, absolutely there, David. And I think you gave a really honest and a great comprehensive insight, you know, as to what's going on there and, and, and just generally as well, just the kind of position of the team, because I, I can definitely resonate with a lot of the points you mentioned there too, in terms of Ferrari. I think they still move forward considering where they've been in the last couple of years as well. You know, I think everybody likes a place where they can go in to work and they can enjoy it. And, you know, there's not the pressure of, I don't get this right. I'm going to lose my job or, you know, I'm going to be micromanaged or everything I'm doing, it's being watched and nobody likes that pressure. But at the same time, as you, you need to be comfortable too, in your environment. Yeah, exactly. But then the balance of that, too, is you, you don't want people to just kind of get away with thinking they can do anything. Or, you know, at least when you look at teams like Red Bull or Mercedes as well, they are so kind of clinical in the way they approach things. The, there's no kind of like vibes as such. It's almost as if they're going to do something and they're going to commit to it. And that's it. 
you know, whether people like it, love it or lump it, either way, that's just how the chips are going to fall and how aggressive in certain scenarios as well, like you mentioned, especially with Red Bull, they'll go and the lengths that they will take and, you know, just the, the kind of um, extreme depths they'll go to, to to make sure that they get things in their own interest. And it was interesting you mentioned that because like for Ferrari, I feel like they've missed that type of person you know since the Luca de Montezemolo yeah. days also I remember like you know Ross Braun and John Todd having it out with Max Mosley and um Bernie Eccleston during the call had like a Bridgestone Michelin tire war days of like 2005 2006 as well and now these days like you know, when you're talking about Ferrari, you know, you speak about Bonotto, you've got Lawrence Mackies as well. There's a couple of guys there, but like you mentioned as well, there's, so, some younger... there's lots of clever guys there, but hmm. none of them seem to have that sort of steel to them to a certain extent. You know, they're not the guys that you, as you were saying, like, you know, Luca, like Jean Todd or whatever else, who would like take people to task on stuff. Hmm. But uh, yeah, ah, it's an interesting. I had, another, I had another thought, but I'm chasing it because it's wandered off. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you some time to recover it, David. Because whilst you're doing that, I want to take also a wider look at the world of motorsport. Because you know, we we've had a really detailed and really good conversation there about this Ferrari situation, and I don't think there was a person better qualified to talk about it honestly with other than you. You know, so that's been amazing, and we'll definitely come back to that too. But in the meantime. You know, there's still other things that we should be super excited about, especially if you're a Tafosi or a motorsport fan. For example, you know, Ferrari have a completely new GT3 sports car that's going to challenge next year in the SRO World Championship, the 296 GT3. Also, on the topic of Ferrari, you know, you've also got the LMDH program, which they're part of too, with their V8 prototype hybrid car that's going to challenge in the World Endurance Series. What are your thoughts on that as well there, David? And, you know, and also... I know that you also went to Brands Hatch and you met my one of my favorite drivers, of course, Mr. <laughs> Lello himself. You know, and I know that you often travel avidly to these uh, races and, and, and motorsport events too. So, you know, just for our listeners at home as well, could you give them an insight into what it's like as well? And, you know, could you, what encouragement would you give them to, to go and watch these races? Because for someone like myself, I've always been a TV watcher. I've never gone to actual race myself or had somebody to go with, you know? So, It'd be interesting to get that perspective too. So you get different things from different races. There's, I mean, as I said, during the touring car uh, the other day, it was like pretty much a choice between you could watch the track action or you could wander around a lot. But it's like if there was the best way to grow in that sort of thing is where there's a group of you where you can pitch your spot and someone's always there because otherwise you're never going to really see stuff. Um, you you can't sort of have a casual spot when it's that busy. But, I mean, I've not since Netterton that busy in years, possibly because I've not been to touring car there for a while. But, you know, if you go to, like, GT or stuff there, there's nothing like that in terms of people. But the longer format racing for GT works for me because it means I can watch some of the racing and I can wander around and I can see this and I can go to the GB3 paddock or whatever and see if I can pick up autographs or the wherever, you know. Um to a certain extent, it depends on what you want to do. As I said, there are some people who are quite happy pitching their seat on a corner and sitting all there all day watching cars go past. And I spent lots of years just doing that, um, you know, before I realized, well, actually, if I wander around here and hang around here, these are the stars of the future in F4 or whatever who we're going to be seeing, you know. Um, but, I mean, you've got British F4, which is supporting the BTCC. and if you go back a couple of years, you know, 2016 when it was 2015, sorry, when it was still the MSVR series, you had Lando Norris racing in it, Colton Herter racing in it, Dan Tickton racing in it, you know, lots of big names. Um, you've had going back to 2018, I think it was, was it 2017, 2018, we'll say. Um, the guy who won it has sadly basically run out of money and not been able to go anywhere. But the guy who finished second that year was a certain Oscar Piastri, and the guy who finished third was a certain Logan Sargent. Yeah, so and so you never know where these kids racing at that level are going to wander off and go up to. You know, this year, I mean, 
GB3 last year, which is supporting the uh, like uh, the British GT Championship, for example. Um, you've got about three guys in that who are now racing in FIA F3. So, again, potentially stars of the future. One of them is now Williams Junior Driver. You know, um, this year in F4, you've got, you know, uh, Ugo Kachuku, who's like in his rookie year in F4, who's McLaren Junior. Um, there was Oliver Gray, who's his teammate, who's Williams Junior. There was a fast guy, I can't remember if he's from New Zealand, called Louis Sharp, who's like in his first season in this country, who's only just turned 15. He's pretty quick. He's back by Roden. And that's just the Carlin team. <laughs> you know, in high tech, you've got um, Alex Dunn, who's in his like second season in F4, but he's walking the championship by quite a distance. You know, he's done very well, but he's also fourth in Italian F4. And Italian oh. and like German F4 are like the big F4 series, you know? Sure. Yeah, if, if you win them, that's like the first sign of superstardom almost. So there's, you don't know who you're going to meet and what they might end up doing. Yeah. Um, when more international series used to come to this country by pre Brexit and pre COVID and what have you, you know, we, ran into we got Lando Norris autograph three times at various events. Wow. So oh. yeah, 2016 Formula Renault, 2017 uh Euro F3 and 2018 G uh, F2. So it's you know you can you can meet these up and coming guys and they're just kind of there hanging out you know, waiting for race time. That's so interesting as well that you mentioned that, David. And like like you mentioned too, there's just so many, like just the names you're mentioning there too, like even this Logan Sargent, for example, American racing driver, which has done, you know, a few years in the in the junior categories as well. But again, he looks like he's tantalizingly close to William C. Should they decide, you know, to, to kick Latifi? And then even on the other side, you mentioned it as well, Piastri, which again, is such an exciting driver to watch because he's practically won every single junior series he's he's ever actually competed in and like before well, he his record on... in this his record since he came over to this country was like he did a parts because i did a video on this not too long back so bear with me you know he did a part series in uae f4 where he got three podiums his first full season was uh, that one in f4 where he finished sec british f4 where he finished second and towards the end of the year he was the strongest driver in the category and he had more poles than anyone else um, his first season in Formula Renault was with Arden, who in Formula Renault weren't the strongest team, so he finished eighth overall, which is out of like 22 drivers. So it's still not bad. <laughs> you know, he switched teams to the next season, but they just switched chassis. So, you know, it was like a new car to everyone. And he won that year battling very hard against Victor Martins, who was also very, very good. Um, so that was a tight and interesting fight. Um but he won that one. Then FIA three, which obviously won. It was another very tight and very tense battle between him, Logan Sargent, Teo Pucher, Teo Pucher. You know, there were some really good names there, but it was a screwed up season because of COVID. So, and then F2, obviously, where if anyone had any doubts about, you know, well, he did win them titles, but they were close. You know, F2 wasn't exactly a shabby grid. You know, he was teammates to Robert Schwartzman, who'd run F3 the year before he did and had a year's more experience in them cars. Yeah, that was by no means, you know, I I was expecting him to do well. I wasn't expecting that from him. So, you know, I you can't say, I don't think anyone can look at those results and say he shouldn't be in Formula One at that point. And in five seasons... Worst finish of eight out of 22. Other than that, his lowest was second. Wow. That's crazy. Absolutely, you know, and that's the thing as well with this piastri and this situation that's kind of tumbling on as well. There's a few people that, you know, as part of the community have said that he's in the wrong for kind of like leaving Alpine. And we had Brad on, on the podcast a couple of weeks ago as well, just saying that, you know, whilst Alpine have showed him a level of support and maybe given him some funding and stuff like that, in his latter junior career, the earlier phase that has been him, his family, and all of his like you know um sponsor partners as well. So 
how much he really put down RP and how much he put the success to him and this his ability and his consistency, I think it's more fair to give that to Piastri himself as a driver and the young man he is and just generally as well. Never really been in much controversy. He seems very like level headed and very determined. And it'll be super exciting as well. Like you mentioned Lando. A quick question I'll ask you on the topic of this as well. How do you think you'll go you'll fear against uh, Lando if the two of them were in the same team at McLaren next season? Um. Well, I think Lando went out on experience and because he knows the team as much as anything else. But Piastri on his day will be close. But a rookie is still a rookie, you know. They're, they're going to have good days. They're going to have bad days. But Piastri on pace could give Lando a run for his money. Yeah. But Lando's another one who his record is ridiculous in junior formulas. So, I mean... I mean, I don't know if you know too much about Lando's junior career, but like 2016, he did three full championships plus part championship in British F3. Mm -hmm. And he won all three of the full championships and got four victories in British F3. Jeez. You know, it's, that's an ins you know, that was an insane season. Uh, so that was the year he first came to my attention. Um <laughs> Um, let's say he won, like he'd won the championship the year before in MSVR, which then became British F4. He won Formula Renault Euro Cup, Formula Renault NEC, uh, Toyota Racing Series, which had a good load of drivers in it that year, and multiple victories in British F3 when he was taking part in it. That was all in 2016. So 2017, he won Euro F3. Um, for Carlin, bearing in mind that it was during a period of complete and utter prima dominance. True. You know, it's like his F2 season, he considers one of the worst of his career. He finished second. Which, by no stretch of the imagination, is, you know, something to scoff at either because it's super competitive as well. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that. A lot of people point out that Lando had a lot of money and he could do a lot of testing, which is all very true. But, you know, he, he the same as Oscar, won most of them championships as technically a rookie, albeit with a lot of testing. Well, so, you say that as well, David, but then again, so did Nikita Mazepin, so did Latifi as well. These are also affluent drivers that have been fortunate to grow up with, you know, families that can afford it, you know. And at the end of the day, I feel that people shouldn't criticise drivers just because of their funding or, or what kind of things they've had. I, I think people need to look at drivers based on how they utilise the tools to their advantage, you know. And if you're somebody like Lando Norris, which has been competitive yeah. in every series, you know, and then he's been at McLaren since he joined Formula 1 and McLaren have not had a yeah. championship winning car, but he's still on days been able to challenge Max Lewis, you know, and, and achieve multiple podiums in a car that's not really fit to, to be on the post the podium most of the time i think it's yeah. testament to him you know but what money does give you is opportunities it gives Absolutely. you more sets of tires than your opposition might have to do testing with you know it means you can get in better teams and have the better engineers with you it means that you can run three different season three different championships in a year and do the relative testing for them as well you know it's if if you have two equally good drivers but one of them's racing for Prima and can do as much testing as they like, and the other one's racing for you know, Charousse, and they can't go testing because they don't have any money, they're going to end up in very different places in the championship. And which mm -hmm. one would you, just looking at results, consider was better? That's, That's what true. money will give you. Exactly. You know, and I think it, it's... So it's a strange thing with like you know f2 as well because most people just look at it and they say oh well it's a spec series so surely the best driver wins out but as you correctly mentioned there as well david like you know if you're in like a art or if you're in a prima or if you're in one of those teams you obviously stand more of a chance of you know maximizing the opportunities there to you just because they have more resources and that all comes into funding and stuff like that too so yeah, it is quite an interesting thing, and I think a nuanced point that most people take for granted, you know. But also another question I wanted to bring to you as well, David, was, um, you know, on your kind of motor racing experiences and, and trips as well, you had the very rare opportunity of meeting one of the greatest race car designers of all time, being Adrian Newey. 
you know, could you tell us more about this experience? And actually, whilst I flesh out this question a bit more, what do you think of the modern day engineering, like, you know, the scene at the moment? Because we kind of lived in a history of time where you had likes of like Colin Chapman, Gordon Murray, John Bernard, James Allison. But it looks like, especially in Formula One, the emphasis on like a single inventor or a single designer or, you know, like, um, like, almost like um, car maker in that regard has, has changed. What's your view on that? Well, it's to do with size, isn't it? You know, if you, I mean, back in the day in the 60s, 70s, 80s, to a certain extent, you'd have teams that have like 40, 50 people. You know, the original Tyrrell team was run out of a woodshed. Um, now look at where they're at, you know, Mercedes, 1,200 employees just on the F1 team of another 800 on the engine department. You know, so, the sport as a whole has grown so much. I mean, we love harking back to like these characters, these famous designers, you know, the people who could look at something and find something no one else could. But that doesn't unfortunately perhaps work so much with the racing world as it is now. I mean, Adrian Newey is very much a kind of throwback thing because, you know, he still sort of visualizes something in his head, looks at something on another car and like pen and paper almost working it out um he's sort of like the last of the breed i think you know there's some very good designers and head of design departments and stuff now but you don't necessarily you know they're not in the way that people talk about gordon murray or john barnard or adrian newey or you know no there's no engineers chief engineers around that people think of in the way they think of patrick head you know I mean, Williams back in the day was an amazing school for engineering. I think it was like their seventh employee was like, you know, Ross Braun. Yeah, it's that kind of thing. And because the sport has got so big, it was sort of in danger of losing that personal touch to a certain extent. But now, as I said, you have so many teams doing like video chats with this person this week and, you know, half the teams seem to have like a YouTube channel or they'll post like after the race stuff or whatever, Ferrari and McLaren both do certainly, you know, you see because of the rolling 24 hour access you seem to have, you see so much more of it as well. So whereas you're not so aware of perhaps individuals as you used to be, you have so much more access to the team as a whole. So it, there's pluses and minuses to both things, I suppose. In some ways, it feels less personal now, but it's sort of spread out more. But in other ways, it's almost more personal because you feel like you're more invited in with the modern technology that allows you to see everything. That's true. You know, like you mentioned as well, David, like I guess the sport itself has just grown exponentially over the years as well. When you see, you know, like McLaren doing, like you mentioned as well, these like uh, video kind of graphics or, or like you know, like short kind of YouTube content kind of uh, stuff as well. Like when you see the factory and just the, the workers inside there as well and some of the top names in each team as well. For example, for them, it'll probably be like James Keys, you know, or for like Mercedes, you've got James Allison. Yeah. You know, there's so many different personalities as well. So I guess it's become a much more bigger circus as such. But like you mentioned there as well, I think it gives people, because the sport is so big now as well, there are more people, more jobs, more opportunities. And, you know, we even had like a Red Bull engineer on here the other day, like a design engineer and just like... Yeah, I was even... listening to was the engine guy. Yeah, yeah, you know. I was just... listening to that earlier today, actually. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. doing nothing for my sense of like self at all, you know. It's like I'm coming on this podcast because, you know, I chat to you guys. It was very kind of you. And you had Mario Andretti on here. You had Raffaele Marcello on here. You had all these presenters on here and, you know, commentators and all this. You had people from, like, the Red Bull engineering department. You've had people from, like, Mercedes on here. And then you've got me. <laughs> well, David, we 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 love you, and you know, well, we a quiet we, month. What can we do? <laughs> <laughs> we 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 honestly like you know, we respect you just as much as the people you mentioned because at the end of the day, like for me and also Georgina as well, which is the owner of this kind of platform too. Like, it's about kind of going 
you know, behind the kind of scenes, you know, and having conversations, meaningful and deep conversations yeah. as well, you know, to discuss these things, you know, and kind of also, I guess, a good segue. It's almost as if you've got my script or notes in front of me because, you know, I also feel as well, David, we should use the opportunity, you know, to get to know more about you and to kind of like get your take on certain things. And for me, it's episodes like this I enjoy the most because it's almost like having a conversation, you know, with a close friend, you know, and, and being able to bounce ideas and to see different perspectives as well, you know. So, well, that was the, the thing first... when you were on my channel, was is a very much sort of a collaborative effort, almost in the true sense of the word. Because I, I, if I'm left to my own devices, can run out of things to say very quickly. I'm kind of at my best on these things if I bounce off someone who is you know perhaps slightly more organized the questions and i am on there <laughs> <laughs> well I, I try david yeah of course but, you know we, we we even like typing silly stuff on twitter we have good conversations so yeah and this is the thing as well that i, I just love about our kind of social space and the kind of community we have because you know we should be able to kind of have a bit of fun have a bit of, ba of banter i tag you and stuff as well you respond or i might say something and then you kind of respond back and i, I like the engagement and i kind of like the kind of place that we have because when you listen to other people's like, online experiences it could be very dark and almost in a different kind of realm to kind of the stuff that we see you know but it's nice you right. know I, mean, I don't i don't get hate i don't understand it as a concept you know what i mean there's the the stuff i don't i mean don't get me wrong there's stuff i don't agree with i don't necessarily like but you know it's like if you dislike something you don't need to respond to it or whatever you know everyone else kind of so, like uh yeah and like impose that kind of hate on other people or try and kind of like create like a swarm of angry people to hate on one person yeah. too you know yeah so uh, although i did yeah. have i did i did have it once where the irony was it was like someone i knew had made completely innocent comment and someone had jumped on them for it and i sort of rented something along the lines of like you know so if you don't like a comment you don't have to like comment on it and all this sort of stuff i yeah. ran on a right lecture about it and this person just response was he's written a whole lecture on why if you like don't like something you don't need to comment on it because he didn't like something so he commented on it oh my days as well <laughs> it's just like at that point i'm like yeah i've been a bit of a hypocrite here. <laughs> <laughs> well david this is the thing as well it's like i sometimes well i just see stuff online i just I don't even bother engaging with it, you know, because I feel like with certain yeah. certain people, you always just get people out there like that are trolls and they'll deliberately try and wind you up or say things to try and trigger you. And then if you react to it, no matter how, what you say, if someone will try and spin it in a negative light or try and like take it out of its original context and then make you out to be the bad guy. So it's just one of those things, unfortunately. But at least kind of for like us and, you know, you and everybody as well in our kind of like tight mate community, it's great, you know, because we get some great conversations going. We get to, you know, have some nostalgia and some old memories or things I didn't know about before. And, you know, I learned from you and other people as well. And it's just great, you know, and I think this is kind of what, direction we want to take with the platform and you know collaboratively with you as well and also your channel which we'll get into later as well you know i would i think it's going to be the future and what people you know like sign up to and want to be part of as well so um yeah it's an exciting time for sure as a content creator and in in that regard as well david like i mentioned you know we really want to get to know more about you and our listeners as well are going to be so keen to like follow you up and to kind of know more about the man behind you know the um the the ferrari red merchandise and whatnot but um you know let's get into some of these questions then so i've the had that on, hang on. i had that uh, um snetterton where um someone i talked to on twitter who is like the human for the mclaren doggo account oh, okay and, <laughs> and I'd, you know i knew that like they were going to be there and stuff and she ran into me wandering around the f4 area and she was like i thought that was you i saw i saw the red jacket and thought who else is wearing red around here <laughs> <laughs> see spurred you from a mile away david spurred you from yeah. a mile away you're unmissable <laughs> all right well in terms of the questions david let's get into it so the first one is if money was no object and you could buy an F1 car to keep forever, which car would you acquire? Bear in mind, you can only pick one and money's no object. So you can literally get any F1 car, but you can only have that one F1 car. 
The problem is there's so many and there's so many different reasons for it. You know, mm. it's like different people different people have a different idea about beauty. They have a different idea about what they want in a car, what attracts them to cars. You know, um, one thing I've tended to find about people who like Formula One cars is, you know, the classic one, the ones they always go back to are the ones that they fell in love with when they first started watching the sport. So, yeah. you know, I know people who, I mean, for me, it's like the cars from like 89, 90, 91, you know, whether it's the Marlboro livery, McLaren, or obviously the Ferrari, you know, the 641, I think it was, like the Mensa, Alan Prost one, there's a sort of simple elegance to them to me, you know. Um, I just like the proportions. I like, you know, other than the rear wing, I think this year's Ferrari is possibly one of the best looking Formula One cars of, since those ones. You know, there's certain similarities to them, just not obviously in size because modern cars are about half the size again. But, yeah, you know, there's similar sort of scale proportion almost. And I kind of like that simple elegance. Yeah. Um, so for me, it would probably be something from that period. And whereas I want to say the Ferrari, um, other contenders, obviously, and McLarens from that period, because I do love the Marlboro livery, and they were pretty nice looking cars as well. There's like Adrian Newey's early design for like Leighton House, which, you know, then went on to show itself more in the Williams he designed for like Mansell and Prost and stuff. Um, there's also... Obviously, the Seven Up Jordan is. I've got a big shout on that one. Ooh, that is a legendary one. And then, like Michael Schumacher as, as well, making his debut in Spa with that Seven yeah. Up livery as well. And just ah, oh, yeah, so iconic. The, there's some, there's there's so many tempting ones there. I mean, my favorite Jordan one, weirdly, is the uh, ninety seven uh, Benson and Hedges bitten and hissed uh, Sid the Snake. Oh, okay. Oh, so like because i think when i started like getting into formula one as well they had like um the yellow and black kind of like uh country kind of like color scheme as well and there's one where it almost had like a shark's like uh teeth on like yeah, the nose that, as well that was from like the early 2000s I can't remember if it was 2002 something like that it might have been later but yeah during like 97 they basically experimented with liveries and stuff because in 96, they'd had like a proper gold for like the Benson and Hedges. You know, it was that kind of gold. And apparently in real life, it looked stunning. But like when you saw it on the TV, it just looked a bit brown. Um, so basically for the following years, they went like instead of gold, they kind of went yellow. Um, but then the yellow and black and like they had like a snake's head and fangs on it going down to like where the front wing was. And because that livery was so different to everything else out there and it had attitude you know um i really really loved that livery um and then after that they went um buzzing hornets so they had like the hornet fr face on the front of the car and eddie jordan was like he much preferred that one because they could position sponsors and stuff better for it which obviously helped them financially um but that was like their most successful period in history during that point <laughs> You know, like 97 through to about 2000. So, but them cars are all nice as well. I've got, you know, I've got seen like the 99 one, I think it was quite close up because someone had like, there was a car show thing locally and someone had got hold of the test car, like the backup car, you know, back in the days when they used to have like third cars for teams. Someone yeah. had got hold of one of them and that was apparently the third car that they had at Spa in like 98. And if like one of, they hadn't been able to repair the damage to one of the driver's cars and they'd have ended up going out in that car, that car could have won the one that won the race. But they like, I think they fit. I can't remember exactly. My understanding is basically they repaired Damon Hill's race car so that he didn't have to use that. So it didn't get the glory. <laughs> Because I was thinking uh, anyway, as well, is back that to, the, back the to your question. Infamous, yeah. <laughs> no, but just talking about that as well there, David, like, was that the year when there was a huge pileup in uh, in Spa? And, like, uh, yeah, I think the Michael had it out, with... out on the first lap or something. And uh... Exactly. Didn't David have it out with, um? didn't Michael have it out with David, sorry? And then it was between Ralph and uh, Damon. Well, yeah, what happened was that, um, it's, you know, 
is you had the huge accident at the start, so they had to restart it. And obviously some of the drivers were able to use the third car and some weren't. And Michael got off into a commanding lead and it looked like, you know, he was going to sail away to victory and gain points back on Mika Hakkinen. And there was what can be best described as a misunderstanding between him and Coulthard. And Michael lost in the spray, sort of lost track of where Coulthard was. And he felt that Coulthard had basically slowed down and um, he went into the back of him. Now, you know, when you're in adrenaline, you've just been in an accident, you know, you were leading the race. This was your big chance to gain points back on your opponent and you collide with their teammate. You can see why he might have been a bit sort of like suspicious about that. Um, sure. For my for my part, I don't think anything was really. I don't think there was any intent in it. It was just like you know, wet weather and misunderstandings, which can happen. But <laughs> in the heat of the moment, I don't think Michael necessarily saw it that way. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, either way, David, I think it created like one of the most like iconic kind of things as well. You know, there's always that video that goes around on YouTube yeah. too of like Michael storming down the pit lane and then like the McLaren so, mechanics like trying to hold him back you know well, and, so, uh, pe yeah. people always say you know Michael never showed you know emotion always like this robot you know very whatever well I, I think he showed some that day um, yeah absolutely you know I think there's many times you know so I, I kind of get mm. it like when people talk about like Michael Schumacher and this is stereotypical kind of like Germanic kind of approach to stuff but I think he could be very emotional you know and, and he showed it yeah. you know to the people it needed to be shown to rather than like you know having outbursts or you know again like he he conducted himself in my opinion in a very professional way and probably how racing drivers yeah. should you know so I, I didn't have an issue with it and to be honest maybe I'm just a, like a biased kind of Michael Schumacher fan too because that's like my favourite driver growing up and what who got me into Formula 1 you know so without Michael my yeah. whole thing would be would be different but yeah it's an interesting one to look on memory lane there David but next question I don't think kind I answered of, that I, one did I? <laughs> nah well I mean, you gave us an array and I think again all of those cars they, they so as a 10 car garage <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> these are the ones I would pick. <laughs> but uh, yeah, any one of that lot, that'll be fine. Sure, and actually, I think it segues nicely into the next one. From your perspective, what's the best Formula One car to ever grace the sports history? So, in my head, I've always said Ferrari F two thousand and four or Mercedes W eleven. I know Georgina is smiling as well because she has an ongoing joke that I cheat on the W11 every time Mercedes make a better car than the W11, but that's, there's no evidence to be substantiated there. And uh, obviously the, um, the well, obviously Senna's kind of McLaren's as well, like the MP4-4 series as well. But in your perspective, yeah. David, if you had to pick one as the greatest or the best F1 car to ever grace this street sport, which one would you choose? It is a tricky one. Um, <laughs> yeah, obviously the uh, 1988 McLaren is a sort of a bench-setting car on the grounds that it won basically every race other than one where one of their drivers had a retirement and the other one crashed. And Ferrari got a 1-2, which was like the race after Enzo died, pretty much. So it was almost oh. like poetry. Um, but apparently Ross... Br um, sorry. Um, the guy who ran McLaren, he was so annoyed that basically because of the events of what happened at Ferrari ended up ruining their clean sweep. That was apparently why he then got um, Gordon Murray to design the uh, McLaren F1 road car. So oh, rumor has it. That's an interesting lineage though. And again, we talk about like the best cars, generally speaking, too. Like the McLaren F1 kind of like, well, is it a sports car? Is it a hyper car? I'm sure people will let me know. That's just regarded as one of the most legendary kind of automotive adventures as well. So interesting mm -hmm. to kind of see the lineage there. I mean, it's insanely ahead of its time. And you think, you know, it was like doing 241 miles an hour in the early 90s. And we wouldn't hit that again for about another 15 years. You know, another 10. Mm -hmm. Not until, um, obviously, the Bugatti. They run. So... It, it, that's sort of in a thing that in a world that moves as fast as the automotive one does in terms of like 
pushing boundaries, any car managing to hold any record for any length of time is a massive achievement, you know? It, it probably was a game changer. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just thinking about it as well, David. Like, there's another question that we love to ask, um, you know, the guests as well when we're trying to get to know more about them. This one's called Taxi, Dinner and Avoid. So this one, it just applies to the current, like, drivers on the grid and kind of as the yeah. name suggests. If you had to take a taxi ride into town to have a dinner with one of the drivers and then there was one driver you absolutely was trying to avoid and just, like, trying to avoid them like the plague. Which drivers would you pick for each one of those categories? The taxi, the dinner, and the avoid? Um, tricky one. Uh, it's not. I mean, I'd say dinner with Charles Leclerc, just because he's always seemed like a very likable guy. Obviously, he's a Ferrari aficionado. Um, so I can imagine just talking about racing and that would be quite a thing. Um, avoid... I hesitate to say Fernando Alonso, but I mean we've got Fernando Alonso's autograph, but he's always he was always mobbed, you know. So it's sort of like can you imagine coming out of the world of Formula One where you're in your little bubble into World Endurance Championship where anyone and their dog can like try and grab your attention and your time. It must be very difficult to focus and to relax in that environment, I should imagine. So you know, when we got his autograph, he came off very, I don't know, but basically like a guy who was very feeling very harassed, for want of a better way of putting it. Oh, no. uh, I don't even think he saw half the people who were trying to get his autograph because, you know, so many. And um, there were people out after the race day, um, there were people still outside, like the Toyota um, hospitality area, until they kind of got kicked out at like half eight at night. Fernando Alonso is incredibly good at what he does. He's incredibly focused at what he does. He has an end goal. He wants to achieve that goal. And I genuinely feel like there is nothing else in the world other than that to him. Um, I find him a very easy person to respect, but I don't think he's someone I could really have any, you know, he's a difficult person to warm to. That's how yeah. I feel about him. Uh, you know, I, I don't say he's a bad person by any stretch of the imagination, but can't imagine having a conversation with him um which leaves a taxi driver uh, they're all better drivers than me in fairness um <laughs> debatable there david very debatable <laughs> well, yeah but you th- you, ha- you have to think about it even like you know we joke you go at the likes of latifi and stuff but he's still a person who spends his time driving 200 mile an hour cars that you know is he does he belong in formula one no but Formula One is supposed to be the twenty best Formula, you know, twenty best drivers in the world in theory. Um, so, yeah, no, not belonging in it doesn't make you a bad driver. You know, I'm sure at a GT level or something, he could probably do very well for himself. It's all relative. Hmm. Yeah, there's layers. Um, so even he's far better driver than me. <laughs> right? Who would I like to? So, Charles, because, you know, can discuss lots of stuff. Fernando, because probably couldn't discuss lots of stuff. Who, who, who's a relatively safe pair of hands, but quick? <laughs> um, I was going to say Seb Vell, hmm. maybe. I'd say Seb, actually. Yeah. Seb's a good shout. I would have thought so, too. And again, just like, I think Seb kind of fits a similar mode to me and you as well, David, when... You're talking about kind of like the history of Formula One. Obviously, he, ha- he owns that Williams, uh, I think it's the FW14B yeah. as well. That yeah. actually be a really cool taxi driver to have. And this is the conversation you'd have leading up to meeting Charles as well. Funnily enough as well, both of them were teammates at one stage too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the FW14B in the flash at all, but it's a really weird car to be around. What makes um, you say that? Because wh- to me, it looks like... I don't know, David. I've always looked at that car and I was like, that's how a Formula 1 car should look. But it's like pointy nose. Yeah. I'm sure, like, it's yeah. got like, the active yeah. suspension but, thing too. Yeah, the, the, active suspension, the active suspension is the thing. Because mm-hmm. I've, I've been in a garage area with it when they were testing the active suspension. And it's oh. the trippiest thing in the world watching this car going up and down on its own. <laughs> it's like the freaking thing is breathing, you know. It's just mad. 
oh, I could imagine. And again, like, I guess we can have a conversation about it as well. It's just like, for that time, I'm sure like artist suspension wasn't completely new because I think I want to try and remember who it was. I think somebody tried to pioneer it at Lotus. And I think Colin Chapman yeah. had just signed it off, but then Colin Chapman died. And then after that, it was harder to get the Lotus lot to kind of like buy into it. So it got shelved for a couple of years and then resurfaced. Lo- like, yeah. Lotus's main crazy. problem with like pushing the development and stuff of it was basically money. Because oh. by like the mid 80s, they were practically realistically running one car with one quality driver and another car with someone who was going to pay them a little bit of money to help them. Um, mm. So obviously with. Colin Chapman as well. A lot of the sort of creative spark of the team, for better or for worse, kind of disappeared as well. Um, they were already by the time like Senna was with them, very much a sort of shadow of their former selves. Um, and obviously, pushing and developing any new technology costs money. And a team on a downward slide isn't ever really able to push stuff as much as like. The team like Williams, which took back to back titles in the mid 80s. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of it was like fresh faces and new engineers and new blood coming into Williams as well, um, you know, wanting to push new ideas. And is it not Patrick? Obviously, Patrick Head was the guy who was like the head engineer at Williams. Then you had God, who was the other guy who went from Williams to mercedes and then back to williams and that didn't work out oh is it paddy low paddy low Low, yeah because he was apparently the guy who did a lot of the electronics and stuff on like the active suspension um again another guy who's like a massively successful engineer who came out of williams they were properly a breeding ground for that stuff um (laughs) because i think it's just the case of like you know patrick head took no messing about or whatever else you know you had to be good to meet his standards um <laughs> so but yeah the the squad they had around then you know paddy low as like young and engineer coming in dealing with the active suspension and stuff you know obviously patrick head in charge of engineering as a whole adrian newey you know genius designer Williams in the early 90s, especially with that Renault V10 power plant, they're a force. There is reasons why. I mean, Mansell was like, in 92, was like some races, he'd be a second quicker than his own teammate, never mind everyone else, just because he was so at one with that car. So true. That was an an incredible piece of equipment. Yeah, you know, like you mentioned that as well, David. It's like interesting because you hear a lot of stories coming out now where it's like obviously Nigel Mansell could kind of understand and almost like get the kind of mechanical aspect of how that suspension system worked. Whereas like Ricardo Patrese, I think one of his teammates at the time, didn't really like buy into it or didn't believe what it was capable of doing. So he was never able to. Yeah, the story I've heard is simply that you know, two very different types of drivers. So, you know, Mansell came from an engineering background. If they said it can do this, he was a gutsy, on the limit, drive it hard, drive it fast kind of driver. So if they told him he could do this, that's how he would try and drive it. Whereas Ricardo Petrese was a much more, so my understanding is anyway, um, a sort of feel driver. Yeah, You know, he had to feel it. The car had to talk to him. And the problem with the active suspension was it kind of put a layer between you and the wheels. So he just couldn't feel so much what the car was doing to feel comfortable in it. Because, you know, Patrese is not a god of a driver, but he's not a second lap slower than Mansell in normal equipment. Uh, You know... So, I mean, I think that he got out of the car and then basically a one race or whatever grabbed Nigel Mansell by the testicles because, you know, he was like, you know, that's big pay you've got there kind of thing. I can't remember the exact quote, but it was that kind of thing, you know, as in like Patrese knew he was respectable. He genuinely couldn't understand or believe what Mansell was doing to him. 
So it's again, that's almost a thing of like characteristics of cars and how they can work for one driver and not another or whatever. So you can have drivers who traditionally look fantastic who, because they just can't get comfortable, suddenly look very, very average. And you wrong car, wrong time, wrong place, it can be a curricular. Yeah, and I, I agree yeah. with you as well, David. And it's an interesting one because, like, as you mentioned there, like, it's the right time, right place for the driver. And I feel people, in in such an odd way, that almost kind of relates to Daniel Ricciardo, for example, which, you know, he had so much success in his, like, obviously earlier Formula One career. Then, obviously, at Red Bull, he's the guy that kind of faced Sebastian Vettel out. And then, you know, like, as soon as he left Red Bull and then went to, to Renault, he still had glimpses, you know, of the, the kind of honey badger as such. But then at McLaren, it just hasn't really clicked for him there. You know, it's always just been a thing where it feels like he's catching his tail and not understanding something about the characteristics of the car. Whereas with Lando, I think it just comes to him a bit more naturally because he's always been part of that McLaren program and, you know, done the simulations and done the kind of reserve driving for them. And and, and just, I don't think Lando knows anything else because it's the only Formula One team he's driven for so far. Yeah. But I mean, if you want to talk about, I mean, Ricardo is an interesting point of case because, you know, he went on to drive for the Red Bull team and, you know, he had success with them getting wins and all the rest of that. But Jean-Eric Verne wasn't that far off him in terms of pace and ability and stuff. But because of Red Bull's policy at the time, despite impressive performances, he got dropped. You know, had he been the person with half a season more experience than Daniel had, would he have gone on to be the Red Bull guy to have all the success and whatever else in Formula One and for us to be saying about him now? Well, you know, maybe if he hadn't made that team move. It's weird how it works out where uh, there can be only be a bit of paper between you, but if you're the guy that gets the shout, <laughs> I suppose it's true in basically all walks of life, but in motorsport, when there's only X amount of seats and it's you or that person, the narrowest of margins can be like the defining thing between you being known around the world and you being known as that guy who runs around in that electric series. <laughs> it's it's so true though and like like you mentioned like john eric Verne was one of the most promising ones to kind of come up in that crop as well but like mm. due to the kind of like um very you know like how, how do i put it like it's almost as, as if like it's a, like a cutthroat kind of environment with the red bull driver academy just absolutely you know, quite get there but shown promise in other series you know which is is always kind of interesting to see where you would have fitted now and kind of on the topic of that of that as well david another kind of um you know like a hypothetical question we'll put forward to you is let's say you become a creative tv director for a cool documentary about a rivalry in f1 which rivalry would you choose and i'm gonna say as well now you can't pick james or uh, well, nicky lauda versus james hunt because that's already out there. I'm going to say you also so can't pick Senna and Prost. <laughs> <laughs> so I was so going to say as well, Senna and Press, because I think in the Senna documentary, they, they did kind of cover that element as well, like fairly enough. So you basically can't pick those rivalries. You have to pick another like rivalry within F1 to, to talk about or to, you know, to, um, to be the creative director behind for a, a Netflix series or a TV show. I mean, the thing is the thing with Michael and Mika Hakkinen to a certain extent was kind of covered in the Schumacher movie so there's not really too much point talking about that either and mm -hmm. rivals is perhaps the wrong word because both of them had very much a lot of respect for each other you know there was more true. a kind of louder true story thing like you know where basically they actually liked each other a lot but obviously you know you're competing um, so the Gilles Didier Peroni one was an interesting one because it wasn't a rivalry in so much as only one of them actually thought there was a rivalry going on. Jill knew nothing about it until Imola when suddenly he felt he was cheated. And yeah, that story doesn't go on long enough after that, unfortunately. Um, so, so many, so many things in F1. I mean, Mansell and PK, that, their time at Williams, that would be apocalyptic, I think. I mean, that whole Williams period as well, uh, obviously with Frank's accident, that's, that was, 
I mean, obviously you've got the Williams documentary, which she talks about that at length because of the effect it had on the team, the family and whatever else. Mm -hmm. But I think I can imagine that making a very good movie. Yeah, the 86 season and 87 season, I mean. Absolutely. And again, just like, you know, for the the newer listeners as well, or, or people that aren't obviously, you know, so kind of like, um, like into Formula One or, or stuff like that as well, David, like what was the kind of, um, just the magic behind that season, you know, in terms of PK and obviously, um, ah, my mind's gone blank here as well now, Mantle as well, yeah. yeah. Well, Mansell was there. He'd spent a season there, previously teammates with Keke Rosberg, and Keke Rosberg had retired. Now, Williams haven't gone a couple of years, three years or so without a title, um, getting hold of Honda power plants, which they knew were a potent thing, um, and just having a car that really, really worked well. Um, they were talking to... Nelson Piquet, who at the time was like a two-time world champion, you know, for Brabham and, you know, had been one of the leading drivers of that generation. So they're like, you know, this guy can lead the line. But what Piquet always says is that Frank Williams had basically promised him number one status if he came to the team, but they never got it down in writing. At pre-season testing, the car had been very, very quick. Um, But Frank Williams, who during the late 60s and 70s had fancied himself as a bit of a racing driver liked driving cars quickly unfortunately was prone to crashing was also guilty of doing that in real life as well and on the way back from testing at Paul Ricard I think it was basically had a huge accident um and they were doctors and stuff were pretty much of the opinion that like his life support and stuff should be turned off Eventually, the team boss, who may or may not have been, oh, God, he's got his own YouTube channel these days. A very well-known guy, anyway, in the world of Formula sure. One, has his own YouTube channel. Um, has been around since, like, the, let's say, obviously, late 70s and stuff. Talks a lot about drivers and races and what they should have done, how they should have done this and what have you. For very, very knowledgeable chat. Anyway, I think he was the team boss at Williams at the time. He may have been in the car with Frank. Um, so him and Ginny Williams are like, you know, trying to French argue wife. with French doctors and stuff. Eventually, they, that's his wife, yeah. Uh, eventually, they get him back to England. And basically, Frank went from being this incredibly athletic, incredibly fit, massively driven man to being a paraplegic in a wheelchair who limited use and control of his hands and stuff but can never walk or anything again basically the vertebra just below his shoulder blades and stuff got damaged so obviously that massively affected his ability to do anything but it took him right out of action for the whole you know first half of the season and then some so nobody was really sure what promises had been made or whatever as far as the team were concerned they were obviously trying to deal with how do you fill this void this frank sized void so they weren't running necessarily as slick or on top of things as they should have been but they had themselves with two very quick competitive drivers in a car which was a championship winning car You know, one of the drivers was utterly convinced that, you know, because he was the two time champion, Frank had said that, you know, he should be he should be given number one status to the point where he actually went to the hospital. Frank on his, you know, in the hospital bed, basically on breathing apparatus to help him keep alive at this point. And he's like you said, you know, really sort of animated about because it should have been his and. It kind of got like with Lewis and Fernando during the um, 2007 season where Fernando felt he should have been given number one status and stuff. And there's this young Brit in the British team. Yeah. So Nelson wasn't struggled a bit with that dynamic as well. Sure. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, you know, felt like that Mansell was getting favoritism. And so it very much ended up like that where, what happened at the end of the year was they went into the last round of the season with Mansell PK still very much in contention to win the title, along with Alan Prost driving for McLaren. And 
basically where PK and Mansell had been taking points off each other, Prost had managed to stay in contention. And for Williams, it all went wrong in the race where, you know, Mansell got a puncture. I think it may have been out of the lead that basically ripped his rear tyre off. So that lost him the championship. And they kind of pitted PK just to be on the safe side so that he didn't end up having punches and stuff. But PK was never able to regain the place back. So as a result of basically the team infighting, Frost, in a as Roikinen would do in 2007, then kind of won the championship. Um, but there was a lot of bad blood between PK and Mansell basically as a result of that year. And the following year, it was kind of more of the same. Um, PK would eventually win it on the grounds that Mansell was a bit too good at throwing the car. Mansell was very, very quick, but he did have the accident occasionally. Hmm. Uh, sometimes injuring himself to the point where he couldn't race for a couple of races. I think it was in 88, which cost him the title. Wow. So their relationship was very fractious. Um, PK went on to say some very nasty things about Mansell's wife. Which, again, doesn't really surprise me as well, David, considering some of the other controversial things we've seen from uh, Nelson Piquet Sr. in the last couple of months as well. So I think it's yeah. great that we actually had, you know, you, you actually like elaborated on this more too because it's consistent with the sort of character he was even back in the day as well. And, you know, it just showed you, like, the kind of key word in this question was, like, rivalry and this even in like an inter-team dynamic like yeah. one of the that, first that was, an, that was an ugly one that was an ugly one um, you see interviews with them later on and Mansell never seems comfortable around PK I mean PK's one of these people I've heard people in the team from Williams, Frank Durney I think it was who was like one of the engineers or something at the time and they said they much preferred him to Mansell because they basically found Mansell hard work very demanding, very you know, you're either with him, you're against him, blah, blah. Um, basically, they just found him difficult, whereas PK was one of these people where if you were on his side, he could be very charming, very funny, very what have you. But obviously, if you weren't one of his people, this, yeah, there, there was a very spiteful side to him. You know, which again, it'd be so interesting to see how that would play out. And stuff like Netflix, if you ever listen into this as well, when you do listen to this, please make this a thing as well, because I think David would be David. You've ever actually considered a career in creative directivity? Because this is incredible. Uh, no, strangely enough, <laughs> <laughs> you might have something here. I have enough trouble trying to get the occasional YouTube video out. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, on the topic of which as well, David, and probably we'll round up this one too, you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the excellent content that you share on your YouTube channel. Could you tell our listeners more about it and where they can find you on social media and, you know, the YouTube channel too? Oh, uh, yeah, it's just um, at DGN Racing Fan. Um, on I think it's pretty much Twitter now. Twitter's my main one for motor racing stuff. I do sort of exist in other spheres, but Twitter's the main one for it. Um, obviously, the same on YouTube. It's difficult to describe my channel, to be honest with you, because I'm an accidental YouTuber. Uh, what happened? <laughs> oh, was, What happened was I was like, we were at um, the 20, 2019 WEC Four Hours of Silverstone. And I was just recording odd snippets of my son on my phone and posting them on Twitter because some people liked seeing that. And I was speaking to at the time. And a few months later, I found on my laptop a video editor that I'd had this laptop for about five years at this point and never seen it on there before, but something magically appeared. Um, so I started putting these bits together. And because you can, can't stick like big files on Twitter, I thought, oh, well, I've got on YouTube. And it's kind of evolved from that. So here we are all this way down the road since 2019. And uh, I'm still putting stuff on there. It's a mix between just like, like if I have a thought, sometimes I might find someone who I might ask about it or someone I might speak to about it. And that's how the nine o'clock meeting videos of series of born. Um, occasionally I'll have a thought, uh, 
should need to try and get out quickly so you'll end up with like comments from the couch thing which is just me talking about stuff minimum editing type things mm -hmm. sometimes they'll be like with the oscar piastri thing where i think oh that's quite interesting so I'll sort of have look, more look into how do we got to where we are now and you know talk about his junior career and you know drivers he may have raced against and you know you you, you build up like that um I'd be far more successful if I ever worked out what I can use without getting copyrighted. Um, oh, I have the same thing as well these days. That, that, yeah. That's always that niggly thing in the back of my mind. It's like, is this entirely legal? I don't know. Um, but mostly, basically, what I do on the channel is just try and enjoy making videos and having fun. So, but there's, as well as all that, there's, as I said, the racing videos of me and the little guy at racetrack still, because that's how it all started um so i'll do like an agn adventure of what the boy did up to at the racetrack and um my own thing which will quite often consist of me just watching cars going past but they're expensive cars so i'm quite happy about this yeah <laughs> most people would as well david yeah there's, there's worse things in life oh for <laughs> sure for sure that one will probably copy on like another episode but uh David, you know, I've been super excited for this episode as well. Like, it's touched on so many different wide areas as well. And also, it's just been really interesting to take a trip down memory lane as well in terms of some of the rivalries, some of the best cars, some of the best engineers. There's really a lot, you know, to unpack. And we definitely need you back again later on in the season, you know, so we can have another Ferrari update. Perhaps Georgina or maybe uh, our other resident uh, co-host, F1 Black, might be here too. But um, just generally speaking, you know, it's been amazing just to kind of get your take as well. And a lot of things you said, it's made me actually think kind of on a deeper level, just, just, just like how things go about, how the teams run, you know, just generally speaking as well. It's really eye opening. So, you know, I'm super thankful that you came on today as well. And also I'm just... I'm looking forward to it. Oh, oh, you know, I'm really happy. The first as well. time in about two years that someone's asked me to be on their channel, I'm like, are they sure they want to do that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> David, you need to be in more channels, honestly. And I think off the bat of this one, I think uh, we'll see it a lot more often. That's the thing I said to you when we were on my when you were on my channel. Part of my problem is just the hours I work, because working between work, family, whatever else, it's like I can't start recording until about nine o'clock at night, and then I'm getting up for work on a work day at like quarter to four in the morning. It's the narrow operating window, unfortunately. But no, I do like talking to people about racing. <laughs> oh, don't we you, David? And that's the thing. Like when we have when we can have conversations like this as well and you know, revisit so many things too, it's just really interesting. And I feel like I learned so much from you as well. And I feel our listeners will have that same thing too, David. So I'm always always happy to have you on we definitely need you on for a couple of other episodes later on the season as well so we can catch up and you know explore some of the other experiences you had in the meantime but on mm. that note Dave, is there anything you wanted to say to your adoring fans as well before we wrap up i uh, no, just you know enjoy the racing enjoy if you can going to see some stuff and experiencing being in the world of you know cars at tracks and things um there's a lot going on with it all. Um, just enjoy it. Yeah, so. yeah. Wise words. Very wise words. And, you know, <laughs> I think also, David, you've given me kind of inspiration to finally get up off my ass and actually go to the races too. Because I've always had a thing of, oh, well, what well, you, you've, the, you've missed the one at Brands Hatch you'd have wanted to see this year. But, you know, maybe next year. Yeah, well, I mean, Lelo's confirmed that he's got an AMG contract for next year. So I have to go. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have a choice. Uh, it, I tell you, it must have been something I said to you at the time. It must be so weird for those normal guys who are doing that series for years, and suddenly Valet comes along and people are queuing up outside like his hospitality thing for hours on end, fifty people at a time waiting for him to come out, and you've got like the guys who have been leading the championships for the past four seasons coming in and out, and nobody speaking to him. That uh, must be the most weird thing in the world. Oh, it, it is, you know, and I think it, I, I remember that tweet as well Lello did when he wasn't too happy with the Italian media and how they are, uh, yeah, they acknowledged uh, Valentino Rossi's contributions to the series, but not necessarily his dominance in a certain uh, manicure 
Grand Prix weekend. But uh, mm-hmm. again, it's something we definitely need to discuss in another episode too. Because um, it, it's interesting how drivers perceive fans or media as well, depending on you know who's in the grid and and just generally what the buzz is as well. So I think we've got a lot to explore there too. But, you know, guys, until next time, this has been another sensational episode of the Shipping the Dipping Summer Series. Actually, I'm going to leave you guys on a bombshell. We've got a mystery guest for the final episode of the show. So Mm -hmm. make sure you stay tuned for that because, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, but I'm not going to give any clues away because Georgina will <laughs> rip off my index finger and I need it for my uh, 24-hour... Like, she Lamont. definitely wouldn't be buying you ice cream, dude. Oh, yeah. Oh, you've mentioned ice cream too. That, yeah, that that's also another thing which I need to kind of get onto her for. But we'll get to that. <laughs> but David, it's been a pleasure, honestly. We, we need you on again. And, you know, if there's any developments or anything else, let us know. And listeners as well, make sure you go and follow David on his uh, social media handles as well and on his YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe and check it out as well. It's awesome. I've also done an episode with him too on a nine o'clock meeting channel or or segment as well it's amazing so many amazing kind of like things that we were able to flag up on that episode too so yeah this david is just like honestly one of the most legendary people in the community and um honestly he knows his stuff inside out as well just um yeah he's definitely my encyclopedia when it comes to a lot of things motor racing so (laughs) you guys need to make sure you follow him and that you you know go and show him support and love as well well thank you very much oh no worries at all david well Spin us from Stripping the Dipping, your boy AMG Dance. And until next time, we'll catch you guys very soon. Until next time, 